outnumbered and outgunned, Israeli fighters streak into battle. Their jets are not designed for close-in air-to-air combat. But now, it's dogfight or die. Winning and living depends on superior flying and sheer guts. Now, you're in the cockpit. As Delta-winged Mirages and Neshers duel with heavy-hitting Hawker Hunters and MiG-21s. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Relive the dogfights of the Desert Aces. November 13, 1966, two Israeli Mirage III fighters shatter the dawn silence as they streak towards the Jordanian border. Hostile aircraft are firing on Israeli troops. The Mirages are flying to the rescue. Within minutes, the two Delta Wing Mirages arrive in the hot zone. The Israelis immediately identify the distinctive swept wings of Jordanian Hawker hunters. The Jordanians had a very good aircraft produced by Britain called the Hawker Hunter. Now those airplanes did not have the power and speed of the Mirage, but they could be very effective dogfight aircraft. Another pair of 119 Squadron Mirages joins up, but the Israelis are still outnumbered. Four Mirages, against eight heavily armed hunters. The Mirages are here. The hunters are here, attacking Israeli ground forces. The Israelis quickly roll into the attack from 5,000 feet. The adversaries merge into a World War I-style melee at jet speeds. Major Ran Rona, 119 Squadron CO leads the attack. It was our first fight against the Jordanians and the Hunters. It was a very tough fight. Turning and twisting with maximum effort, the Israelis fail to get a clean shot. What was a surprise, they acted, reacted, and maneuvered better than I thought. The French-built Mirages were originally designed as high-altitude Mach 2 interceptors, optimized to attack bombers with air-to-air -air missiles. The fact is that with an interceptor, you want to get up there and accelerate quickly and climb to high altitude. But those interceptors were not initially designed for dogfighting because that was not their mission. Jordanians, trained by the British Royal Air Force, are good. Very good. It's like having a dogfight against the Israelis in a training. You know, in a training, it was tough. And that battle that lasted about six minutes or so, which is very long in air combat, there were no kills. Israelis couldn't get any of the Jordanians, and Jordanians couldn't get any of the Israelis. But Ran Ronan's professional pride and the honor of the squadron demands a victory. He singles out a hunter. Then I was upset and said, no, I must get one. And I found one of them and said, this one, I'm going to shut down. Ronan slips behind his intended victim and manages to track him in his gun sight. His finger is poised on the trigger. Suddenly, the hunter breaks. The Jordanian rolls inverted, dives for the ground. He desperately tries to shake the Grim Reaper off his tail. Then, 
the hunter pitches nose up and zooms skyward. It's a smart move. The Mirage is faster and has a higher stalling speed. In order to stay on the slower hunter's six o'clock, Ronan must slide back and forth. He's unable to get a clean shot. And the constant scissoring is bleeding off precious airspeed. If Ronan gets too slow, he'll stall out, lose control, and become an easy target for the hunter. Ronan balances in the air with stick and delicate taps of the rudder, flying a tightrope between stalling and overshooting the hunter. He pulled, I went here, and then here, behind him. We were very close. We looked at each other. Ran Ronan is seconds from losing the battle. He's pushed his Mirage 3 to the razor's edge of sustained flight. When the Israelis acquired the Mirage 3 in 1962, they knew it wasn't built to dogfight, but it was the most advanced fighter they could get their hands on. There were few countries willing to supply arms to the Jewish state. The Mirage had a strong, streamlined airframe, and at Israel's insistence, two 30-millimeter cannons. It used a distinctive triangular wing shape called a delta, a product of German World War II research into high-speed flight. The delta wing is very efficient. Structurally, it is small, it is strong, it provides a lot of room for fuel, and it also is highly swept so that it reduces the drag at increasing speed, supersonic and uh, near supersonic. While the delta wing is optimized for high speed, the swept wing is more versatile, a compromise between maneuverability and speed. The Hawker Hunter used the more traditional swept wing design typical of 1950s fighters. It was a large wing blended into the fuselage, so it had excellent lift and had a 10,000 pound thrust engine, so it was a, a good, maneuvering platform. The Mirage is faster, but the subsonic Hunter is more maneuverable with a lower stalling speed. It also has four 30 millimeter cannon to the Mirage's two. Now a skilled Jordanian in an older and slower Hunter has put Ran Ronan at a disadvantage in a vertical fight. Mirage is about to run out of airspeed. And he made a big mistake. The hunter pilot suddenly loses his nerve. He breaks first. This is what fighter pilots wait for, the other people's mistake. Now, Ronan seizes the moment. He drops behind the hunter. Before Ronan can get off a shot, the Jordanian dives for the ground and ducks into the hills. The escape route towards the east would have taken him away, and he didn't think the Israelis are that crazy to follow him in that canyon. But he didn't know Ronan. He was crazy. He was determined to get him, and he followed him into the canyon. The hunter skims over the earth at over 500 knots, leaving a wake of dust and kerosene fumes. His only hope is to drive Ronan into the ground or into the canyon wall. I never saw such a low level flight like this hunter, you know, at the bottom of the canyon, never. There was a lot of turning, but he couldn't put the peeper on him and shoot him. He had to be approximately 15 feet below him in order to shoot. He couldn't be at the same level as he was. The 30 millimeter cannon arcing trajectory requires that the Mirage be angled slightly up at the target. I couldn't go two meters down to put my gun sight on him. It's amazing. I was 250 meters behind him all the time. 
For two and a half minutes, the roar of jets echoes through the hills. The hunter pilot maneuvers confidently through the canyon. Behind his oxygen mask, sweat streams down Ronan's face and pools under his chin. The sound of his own heavy breathing fills his helmet. His frustration mounts. It looks like the Jordanian is going to make it. Suddenly, everything changes. Ronan got lucky, and there was a little hill inside that canyon. The hunter raises its nose. Ronan nearly shouts for joy. He was forced to pull. He got to my gun sight, and I pulled the trigger for less than one second, 21 bullets. Thirty-millimeter high-explosive rounds impact with deadly efficiency. The tail of the hunter begins to disintegrate, but the airplane stubbornly flies on. Ronan stares down at his handiwork. What happened next haunts him to this day. The airplane turned to the left 90 degrees. Then he ejected and crashed to the wall of the canyon. That's what I saw, that I, I turned that and I saw it was unbelievable. Splash one hunter. Ronan has his first kill. But his opponent had fought like a lion. I was happy that I was the one who landed safely. On the other hand, after such a fight of eight and a half minutes, the way he did it, leave aside that it's enemies, leave aside as a, as a fighter pilot, as a colleague. I felt that he would have you know, deserved to eject safe. Half a year later, Ran Ronan and his fellow Israeli pilots make history during the Six-Day War in June 1967, destroying the combined air forces of three Arab countries in a matter of hours. Nevertheless, the Mirage III becomes an icon of jet age combat. The cream of Israeli fighter pilots show that it's not so much the airplane, but the man in the cockpit that makes the critical difference. The lightning war over the desert also marks the first dogfight for one novice Israeli pilot, who is destined to earn the title of the world's top scoring jet ace. June 6th, 1967, the Six-Day War. Over southern Israel, two mirages from 101 Squadron are heading west towards Egypt. Number two in the flight is Lieutenant Giora Epstein. He only has three combat missions in the Mirage and no kills. But he is destined to become the world's top scoring jet ace. Epstein and his leader are on the prowl for Egyptian aircraft. And we start turning above at uh, 20,000 feet, and suddenly I see two aeroplanes pulling behind us. But I look, I see it's uh, mirages. Fighter pilots are territorial, especially when it comes to their hunting grounds. So I told them, hey, we are friends, leave us alone. And suddenly I see that they split us down. And when I look where their noses pointed, I see three Sukhoi 7s. The Russian-built Sukhoi is a big and heavy swept wing fighter, very effective in the ground attack role. 
Even so, its 16,000 pound thrust engine can push the Su-7 near supersonic on the deck. Epstein is here. The two interloping mirages are here, diving on the three Su-7s. But another pair of mirages is already giving chase. The seven jets form up into a bizarre, deadly procession. There was one Sukhoi, one Mirage, one Sukhoi, one Mirage, and at the side, Sukhoi and Mirage. And everybody starts shooting together. 30 millimeter cannon tracers rip through the sky. The Egyptians are firing erratically. The mirages are untouched. Epstein watches as first one, then another Sukhoi falls to mirage cannon fire. But a third Su-7 is escaping. A mirage is on his tail. And I see it, the Mirage chase the Sukhoi, and it was a little bit far from him. Epstein sees a chance for a kill, his first. He hurtles earthward, chasing the Sukhoi at near Mach 1. The first Mirage launches a heat-seeking Shafrir missile. It passes under the Sukhoi without exploding. Israeli pilots don't have much faith in the first generation Israeli-made heat-seeking missile. They call it a bidon, or wing tank. We used to say that Shafrir one, if you launch it, it goes like a bidon, hit the ground. The first Mirage now resorts to long-range cannon fire. And then he shoot all his ammunition from the cannons, but too far and nothing happens. Ammunition expended. The first Mirage pulls away. Epstein now slides into position. The Sukhoi has incredible acceleration and is nearing Mach 1. With a loud bang, Epstein advances the throttle into full afterburn. The Mirage's tailpipe glows red hot. The Sukhoi thunders over the desert floor. The Egyptian is racing for home. The young Israeli has other plans. The career path that would make Yora Epstein a master of jet combat was unconventional, even by Israeli standards. Initially rejected for flight training in 1956 due to a heart murmur, Epstein became a paratrooper instead. In 1963, he was finally accepted into pilot training and won his wings. Epstein soon made a name for himself while in fighter training. Every fighter pilot, both new and experienced, hones his combat skills through the practice dogfight. On one such flight, he's pitted against his squadron commander. Epstein accidentally goes into a spin. Now, I was a uh, free fall paratrooper, and I have about 500 uh, jumps at that time, so I feel in the air very comfortable. It, it didn't mean to mean anything that I'm a spin, because I made spins without uh, aeroplanes <laughs> very easily in the air. But Epstein's CO sees impending disaster. But he was getting panic, and he shouted at me, you are the right turn, no, left turn, no, right turn, left turn, do that and do this. At the end, I have to tell him, please, shut up. You just make it harder for me. And I get out from this spin very easily, no problem at all. Epstein advances quickly into the Mirage 3. He is a natural-born aviator and gifted with such extraordinary eyesight that it's actually measured by radar. I can see fighters for 24 miles, when average pilot can see them between 8 to 12 miles. So I have an advantage. In all 
all the dog fights that I took parts, I see the airplane first. Hawkeye, as he's called by his fellow pilots, is now champing at the bit for a kill. Epstein is determined that the big Egyptian fighter hugging the ground in front of him will be his first. I went after this Sukhoi for a very long uh, chase. Epstein finally gets within cannon range, 1,200 feet. The Pipper is on the target. He has visualized this moment for years. Epstein squeezes the trigger. Nothing happened. In his excitement, he's forgotten to engage the cannon arming switch. What I did, I, I hit circle breakers. And at that time, I was 250 behind him, and I gave a very short breast. And the Sukhoi 7 has a huge engine, really huge. All the bullets go inside this uh, engine, and it was a tremendous explosion. And when he came out of the explosion, there is only wings and, and nose. And this little aeroplane that left make the, the smallest loop I ever seen in my life. Duck, and he was in the ground. Giora Epstein has realized his dream and scored his first kill. Six years later, he's at war again, pushing his fighting skills to the limit during one incredible day over the desert. It's Delta versus Delta in one of the most epic dogfights of the jet age. October 20th, 1973. The Yom Kippur War. Giora Epstein leads a warship of Delta Wing fighters to the Suez Canal. He's flying an Israeli built Nesher, a copy of the French Mirage 5. Radar control has ordered Epstein, by now an experienced flight leader and double ace, to 20,000 feet. Egyptian aircraft have been picked up inbound. When we came to the canal, we didn't see anything. And he said that some, he sees something that come from the south. So I looked there and I see a pair of MiG-21s come from the south. And when they are nearly facing us, a few miles, they turn to the west and start going to Egypt. Epstein and his flight are here. The MiG-21s here. The Israelis drop their tanks and give chase, going to full afterburn. In the lead, Epstein gets good tone from his heat-seeking missile. And at that time, the Kippur War, we have good missiles. We have the uh, Shafrir 2 and the M9D. So I launch the missile. And I got a hit, and the number two of this pair explodes and goes down. And immediately I went after the number one. But then, the desert below him comes alive with camouflaged airplanes. Like mushrooms came about 10 pairs of MiG-21s. The Egyptians have led the Israelis into an ambush. Giora Epstein is about to put the Nesher to the ultimate test.
The 1973 Yom Kippur War marked the combat debut of a cousin to the Mirage III, the Nesher. The sleek Delta Wing fighter was born in the shadows of international espionage. By 1967, Israel needed new airplanes to boost its fleet of top-line Mirage III's. They worked with Dassault Aviation to design a simpler and less expensive Delta Wing fighter called the Mirage V. Israel paid France for 50 airplanes. But on the eve of the Six-Day War, French President Charles de Gaulle imposed a total arms embargo on the Jewish state. Israel, with the help of accomplices outside of France, obtained blueprints, which allowed them to build their own version of the Mirage 5. The Nesher, or Eagle, was first flown in September 1969. The Nesher was really a Mirage 3 that was optimized more toward the ground attack solution than the air-to-air -air combat. The characteristics of the Nesher slash Mirage 5 were more in the multi-mission mode versus air combat or intercept. Although the Mirage 3 was lighter and more agile, the Nesher carried nearly a thousand pounds more fuel without external tanks. The slight loss in maneuverability due to the extra weight was more than compensated for by the Nesher's longer legs and extended time on station. Attributes that would prove critical to Giora Epstein in his fight against a swarm of Russian-built MiG-21s. The MiG-21 was the standard daytime fighter of the Soviet bloc. The Mach 2-capable Delta Wing fighter was widely exported. Since 1962, it was supplied in great numbers to the Arab states. One of the major differences between the MiG-21 and the Nesher is the tail. The Nesher uses a tailless Delta configuration, typical of Western Delta Wing fighters. But the Soviets gave the MiG-21 a conventional tail, which in their opinion provided better pitch or up and down control. In this duel of Delta Wing fighters, the airplanes are almost equally matched. It is the pilot that makes the critical difference. Epstein will rely on his exceptional skill and warrior spirit to make it through one of the most famous dogfights ever fought in Middle Eastern skies. Twenty MiG-21s have stayed under Israeli radar, using the first pair as bait to draw Giora Epstein's four-ship formation into an ambush. But they make one mistake. They start from too low and too slow, so when they came up to our level, they have no advantage because they are not fast enough. So immediately, we start the dogfight against all of them. Epstein's killed one of the decoy pair and is locked on the tail of the leader. For me, it's about four minutes, maybe more, of chasing this guy. I was behind him all the time, but there is no way I can put my nose on him to shoot him down because he fly, like in Hebrew we say Meshuggener, like a crazy guy. He was doing loops, he was doing breaks, he was doing split S's, he was doing everything in the book, and he trying to shake him off. While Epstein pursues his own MiG, the remainder of his flight has dissolved into a fluid state of mutual awareness. Dogfighting within what Giora Epstein calls the bowl. During the dogfight, inside this bowl, there are incidentally meetings. Sometimes you are going after a MiG and you see one of your friends there and you see a MiG up there. So you told him, look left, up. He say, okay, and he goes. Sometime you see somebody that a MiG come after him and you told him to break. Epstein glances away from the wildly jinking MiG and spots his number two. 
Epstein is here. His wingman is here, chasing down another Egyptian. The wingman fires a missile. The MiG explodes. But the missile's exhaust plume is sucked into the Nesher's air intake, disrupting the airflow and causing the engine to cut out. Without missing a beat on his own MiG, Epstein talks his squadron mate through an engine restart. I told him to close to idle. He closed to idle, open, and it okay. And I told him to go home because uh, I think it's enough for him. Number two leaves the fight. Almost immediately, the other two Israelis also depart. One runs out of fuel. The other has chased a MiG out of the bowl. Epstein stays focused on the crazy MiG driver off his nose. But now he's alone in the bowl with 11 MiG-21s out for blood. October 20th, 1973. Fiora Epstein is alone in the sky with 11 Egyptian MiG-21s. He's been chasing one for five minutes. As the turning MiG bleeds off energy, the chase has been driven lower and lower. All the time, he maneuvered so hard that he lost speed and height. They ended down about 3,000 feet. And that crazy Egyptian pilot started doing the craziest thing of all his maneuver, and that's a split ass at 3,000 feet. The Egyptian is desperate. He'll attempt a diving reversal called a split S. It's supposed to take 6,500 feet to do this maneuver in a MiG-21. Epstein can't believe his eyes as the MiG rolls inverted and pulls down. And I didn't go after him because I think it's too low and I think he will crash. He waits for the fireball. I don't know how, but he went out with clouds of dust. And he thought, that's it, it crashed. Split seconds after that, he sees that MiG-21 raising up like a rocket. <laughs> the Egyptian has pulled off an amazing aerobatic feat, subjecting both himself and his airplane to crushing acceleration forces. Really, he did things that I, I, it's hard to believe that MiG-21 can do. But the Egyptian pilot, for all his heroic efforts, has run out of energy and options. The throttle is firewall. 16,000 pounds of thrust shriek in angry protest against the heavy pull of the desert floor. Epstein is waiting. MiG is dispatched with a short burst. A quick look over his shoulder. Another MiG closing on his tail. Nine more circling, all intent on blowing him out of the sky. Epstein is enveloped by five pairs of MiG-21s. Each pair will take a crack at the lone Israeli. As soon as two MiG-21s complete a pass, another pair is ready to engage. I was on the defense all the time, but from time to time, I have the opportunity to do things. Epstein's epic one versus 10 fight begins with the first pair of MiGs on his six o'clock. 
the leader firing wildly. Epstein will break hard left, forcing the MiGs to overshoot. But his Delta Wing Nesher will lose energy in a sustained turn, making him vulnerable to attack. Epstein throws the stick over. Then levels his wings. It's called unloading, or decreasing the centrifugal G-forces that deplete energy. So immediately, you level the aeroplane and try to gain as much speed as you can until the other pair come after you. If you continue to turn after you break, then you lost all your speed. And then somebody else can come from the outside and kill you. No sooner does he level the wings than he sees two other MiGs directly off his nose. Suddenly I see flashes at front of me and I see two MiG-21s launch missile against me at home. The missiles have no chance of arming or detonating from the forward quarter, but just the impact would be fatal. All Epstein can do is duck. The missiles and MiGs pass right over his canopy. Suddenly, another pair of MiGs moves in from behind. The fact is, and which is lucky thing, is that on your six o'clock, there is a place for only one aeroplane. So they can be 20 or 100 or 1,000. Behind you can be only one aeroplane. Only those who are behind you can kill you. This time, Epstein has a precious few seconds to go on the offense. He'll bank sharply, pop the brakes, lift the nose, and barrel roll smoothly onto the trailing MiG 6 o'clock. In a brilliant display of aerial dexterity, he's turned the tables on the MiGs. Epstein was a master of managing energies. And he always knew what his potential energy is at every spot, and he calculated, he knew where he's going. I mean, that he was good at that. A short burst of 30 millimeter cannon fire. Then a huge fireball. Epstein immediately levels his wings, preparing for the next encounter. The last pair of MiGs move in for the kill. For seven minutes, Giora Epstein has fought alone against 11 MiG-21s. Two are moving into position on his tail. There are less and less MiGs until there is only one pair behind me. Epstein will sense when the MiGs are about to fire, then break hard at the last moment, forcing an overshoot. Then he will reverse sharply, bringing his guns to bear. Epstein breaks. The MiGs flash by, then try bugging out by pulling into a steep climb. Exactly as planned, Epstein reverses sharply, levels, gains some speed, then climbs in pursuit. He lines up the rear of the pair in his gun sight. I shoot the number two, and it hit him in the cockpit. There was no explosion and no, da no smoke, nothing, and it just went all the way down to the ground. The 
the other MiG continues to run. Epstein brings his nose to bear and acquires good tone from his remaining heat-seeking missile. I launch my second missile, which unfortunately went like a bidon. The missile falls away from the underwing pylon. Epstein has the cannon ammunition, but not enough fuel for a chase. It would have been his fifth kill for the day. I was cocky enough to ask the controller if there is any more uh, targets for me. <laughs> so he tell me no. Epstein returns to his base, a forward outpost in the Sinai Desert. After shutting down the engine, he has to be lifted out of the cockpit. My legs shaking and uh, there is no, because it was nearly 10 minutes of very, very intensive uh, thing. 10 adrenaline pumping minutes of dodging and weaving. Rolling and reversing. Pulling maximum positive and negative G. I spoke to him many times. I said, what make you stay there? He says, it didn't even occur to me to leave. There's no, no such a question. I mean, I had the ammunition, I had fuel. Why should I go anywhere? The target's out there, I got to complete my job. He believed that it was unthinkable to leave the battle. And that's what made him a fierce warrior. Four days later, on October 24th, Epstein is back in the air. He shoots down three more MiG-21s. The Yom Kippur War ends the same day. Epstein stayed in Delta Wing fighters, moving from the Nesher into the follow-on Kafir, the last true Delta flown by the Israelis. In 1988, at age 50, he transitioned into the next generation fighter aircraft, the F-16. The Nets, or Hawk as it's called in Israel, represents a quantum leap in fighter aircraft technology. Younger pilots consider the F-16 with its blended body wing design and powerful engine to be the pinnacle of agility and responsiveness. But to many old hands like Epstein, the computer-driven fly-by-wire fighter lacks the purity of the Mirage. You are not flying F-16. F-16 fly itself from his computer. You are only one of many inputs to the computer of the F-16. Me, myself, as a pilot, I need the feelings. I need to enjoy the flight. And in F-16, you miss it. It's not exactly the same. In the Mirage, every flight is, is enjoyable. F-16, you can have unbelievable achievements, but the feeling is not the same. On May 27, 1997, at age 59, Colonel Giora Epstein flew his last mission for the Israeli Air Force. The nose of his F-16 was specially painted to show his 17 kills. All of them scored in mirages and neshers. They are mute testimony to the legacy of the Delta Wing fighter and to the fighting spirit of Israel's desert aces. Giora Epstein remains the world's top scoring jet fighter pilot.